Good morning. My name is Karthik Shinoy. I was a fellow last year at the Rothman Institute, and I am now practicing for the United States Air Force at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas, Nevada. This morning, I'm going to discuss the Rothman experience with bundled payments and why Medicare's BPCI, BPCIA doesn't work for spine surgery. Just a quick overview of the Rothman Institute. It's a large private practice consisting of around 200 physicians and 80 mid-level providers covering all aspects of musculoskeletal care. We have a robust research team, provide the full spectrum of ancillary services, and cover most of the local professional, collegiate, and high school sports teams. The practice is continuing to grow, nearly doubling over the last five years, and as a result, the number of patient encounters, surgeries, and procedures is increasing. The main alternative payment plans we participate in are accountable care organizations and bundle payment arrangements. Today, I will be specifically discussing our experience with CMS's BPCI, BPCIA. When it comes to bundles, most of the industry does not find it particularly appealing, specifically the physicians, whereas the hospitals and the payers are the ones who like the bundle, likely because they are the ones who stand to benefit from them. But the bundle was presented as a big opportunity. It was a chance to curb the overutilization of labs and imaging study, lower the use of specialists, and decrease the number of procedures and discharges to extended care facilities. As altruists, physicians were immediately attracted to this concept. Bundles were supposed to benefit all parties, the patient, payers, and the physicians. From the patient's perspective, the bundle reduces confusion on payments for services and clarifies where money is spent. For the payer, decreasing overutilization leads to reduced costs, and with target pricing, their risk is reduced, but this risk is transferred to the physician groups and hospitals. From the physician's perspective, the bundle was intended to support patient care and improve care coordination and reward those who can assess risk and follow evidence-based protocols. The overall goal was to lower costs. With respect to spine surgery, the bundle presented some unique challenges with regards to reimbursement. In 2014, Schoenfeld published a study showing that spine surgery has a lot of variability in cost due to a variety of factors such as patient complexity, trauma versus degenerative etiology, discharge disposition, number of levels fused, approach, and revision settings, which the bundle does not take into account since they are reimbursed by DRGs. In this study of Medicare payments for episodes of spine surgery, there was 113% variance in costs, and even after making risk adjustments and procedure adjustments, there was still 28 to 47% variability. In another study in 2014, cervical and lumbar DRGs were looked at for nearly 200,000 patients. Significant variation existed between 30-day bundle DRGs, ranging from $11,000 to $107,000. There were significant cost variations within each individual DRG. Post-discharge care accounted for a relatively small portion of overall bundle costs, just about 4 to 8% in 90-day bundles. Total bundle costs remained relatively flat as bundle length increased. The average total cost of a 30-day bundle was $33,000 versus $35,000 for a 90-day bundle. Payments to hospitals accounted for the largest, uh, largest portion of bundle costs, about 76%, which explains why hospitals are much in favor of bundled plans as shown earlier. This study affirms the aforementioned study by Schoenfeld and that there exists significant variation in total health care costs for patients who undergo spinal surgery, even within a given DRG. Better characterization of impacts of a bundled payment system in spine surgery is important for understanding the costs of the index procedure, hospital and physician services, and postoperative care, as this will impact potential future health care policy decision making. As Dr. Gaz mentioned, bundled payments involve a determined target price which is set based on a blended average encompassing all demographics and health statuses and are set also based on DRG codes. There is risk to the hospital or physician group because if the bundle payment does not cover all of the expenses, then there is a loss. But on the flip side, if there is a savings or the spending that is less than the target, there is a gain. Considerations to make with regard to the bundle include the payer and what the determined price will be. There needs to be a collaboration between the risk partners, i.e. the hospital, surgeon, and post-discharge facilities and services. 
there also needs to be a determination of what services will, will be provided and what the length of the episode of care will be. So at Rothman, what did we determine the principles of success to be? The principles would include a robust data collection and dissemination infrastructure for tracking and analysis. We utilized a dedicated bundled payment management team. We needed to have an adequate patient volume and ensure that all stakeholders were on the same page. In this same vein, we controlled the site of service and the post-discharge care or coordinated it to keep costs low by adopting evidence-based clinical pathways. What was most important was identifying and modifying patient risk factors preoperatively. This optimization helped mitigate in-hospital and post-discharge spending. We then identified variations and looked at outcomes and costs. Ultimately, all of these principles came down to managing and lessening risk. As I mentioned on the last slide, the most important risk reduction tactic was preoperative identification of patient risk factors. We used a survey consisting of 58 yes or no questions that would then auto-populate a risk score. High-risk patients were, identi were then identified and were optimized prior to undergoing care. Post-op care is another way to lower costs within the bundle. Home health and physical therapy are going to be much less costly than an admission to a rehab facility. Even more so, controlling the operative facility and shifting care away from university tertiary hospitals to smaller facilities such as ambulatory surgery centers allow for significantly reduced costs. As you can see here at Rothman, looking at the same 1,500 cases, moving the large majority of them away from high cost facilities to mostly low cost facilities allows for a reduced episode of care costs and a 7.5% reduction, reduction in the total cost of care. I mentioned the 2014 studies and highlighted their cost variation, but there are other specific issues that are, uh, there are other issues that are, uh, affect the bundle specific to spine. There are numerous diagnoses and variation within specific DRGs as I alluded to before. There are differences between inpatient and outpatient procedures and then variations from patient to patient with regards to pain management and medical treatment that increases the variability in costs. These outliers are costly and will significantly lower the potential to stay within the targets of the bundle. The Ortho Carolina Group presented their data at CSRS 2016 in Toronto for cervical spine fusions, comparing fee-for-service to BPCI for the cervical spine DRGs. BPCI was associated with, this, with a statistically significant higher total expenditure by 10%. They concluded that this was because the bundles are based on DRG and do not account for disease complexity and variability. At NYU, they similarly found increased costs for spinal fusion bundles. They had success with lower extremity joint arthroplasty and cardiac care with significant cost reductions of $3,000. However, for spinal fusion, costs were found to go up by $8,000 due to costs on new spinal technology. As a result, they concluded that payment initiative does not account for changes and innovations in medical care. In a more recent study by Malik in 2019, a retrospective analysis of the 5% national sample of the Medicare database was performed looking at cervical fusions. There was a large spread on the average 90-day reimbursement by DRG. Their analysis showed a variety of factors that increased spending compared to a baseline of a non-geriatric female without major comorbidities. As you can see, male gender and older age added up added cost. The type of surgery often led to increased costs, and as, expe as expected, comorbid factors resulted in increased costs. Geographic factors also influence costs, with states such as Maryland, Alaska, and Massachusetts having the highest reimbursement, and Puerto Rico and Iowa having the lowest reimbursement. In conclusion, the authors found that the current bundles do not adequately adjust for risk. Based on the bundle model of reimbursing by DRG, it does not account for surgical approach, extent of fusion, the use of adjunct procedures, and the indication for surgery, all of which were found to increase cost. The bundle needs to account for individual patient level, state level, and procedure level variation to prevent the creation of financial disincentive in taking care of sicker patients or performing more complex or extensive fusions. 
The remainder of this talk will focus on what the Rothman experience has been with the bundle. When we did an analysis to look at our readmission rates, post-discharge rehab and SNF, and home health paid utilization, we were well below or at the top 10 percentile, meaning we were performing well. We have had so much success at building a practice and a brand that we thought we could do better, and this was our mistake here, as I will get to. Past efficiency is a part of the BPCI advanced target calculation, and this new model includes cost trend factors that remove the benefit of a nationally expected cost reduction. So when we did our initial assessment for BPCIA, we actually projected that we would lose nearly $9.5 million, but that if we could continue to move all those metrics from the last slide to the top, top 10 percentile or better, meaning moving towards improvement as we were in the past, we would actually be able to make $5 million. So what happened? Between 2018 and 2019, we lost nearly $8.4 million on BPCIA, which was close to what was predicted. So what did we learn? We learned that drivers of the loss were practice maturity, program, programmatic complexity, fracture care, and provider variation. Practice maturity and programmatic complexity is what people have termed the race to the bottom. As you saw, we were already well below the 50th percentile and near the 10th percentile for some of the factors that influence costs like readmission and post-acute post care utilization. Seeing that we were already performing well in these metrics, we weren't able to significantly improve on them and we missed our targets. The primary cost drivers were the targets, fractured care, post-discharge care costs, readmissions, and ER visits. If we take a closer look comparing the baseline to the performance period for fractured care, the volume doubled. With the doubling of volume, there was also a similar increase in SNF utilization, which was associated with increased costs in the performance period compared to the baseline costs. A similar trend was seen with readmissions leading to increased costs during the performance period. And ER utilization, we found that patients went straight to the ER rather than calling the physician's office, office first. This led to higher post-discharge costs through ER billing for labs, unnecessary imaging, et cetera. So looking at each piece summed up, the changing targets, fractured care, post-discharge care, readmissions, and ER utilization summed up to a total loss of about $8.5 million. Looking at all the payers and programs by year, you can actually see that BPCI was marginally successful for cervical spine fusions and very successful for total joints. However, the implementation of BPCI-A led to a major loss. Other payers helped to create a savings opportunity, but BPCI-A did not. We need to continue to move towards a better bundle. We should continue to use the CMS proposed bundles, but use them as a framework upon which to build. The scope of the DRG should be limited and cannot be all encompassing. Similarly, the same target prices cannot be applied to patient populations uniformly. Complexity and risk needs to be incorporated to alter targets and create fair opportunities for all parties involved. Lastly, the bundle models cannot be carved in stone. These are relatively new payment models and we all need to be flexible and adaptable until the final model is achieved. In conclusion, as the bundle payments evolve, we have to continue to practice efficient and value-based care. Also, it is important to note that as a practice matures and is more successful, it is likely that the cost savings opportunities will diminish, will diminish. So do not make the same mistakes we made. As in a standard business model, once pricing is competitive, the product or service has to be better to compete and we will see this shift in the models. These programs are not going away, so we encourage everyone to participate in them now and learn how to manage care more effectively and provide value to the healthcare system. Thank you.